We go to the hospital to be taken care of, to have our wounds mended and our diseases cured. It's where the innocence of new life begins and the wisdom of past generations ends. We trust doctors and nurses to make us feel better and ease our pain because of their advanced level of knowledge and experience. When we go to the hospital with a curable ailment, we expect to get better and go home. Sometimes, though, the cure becomes the disease. In February of 1911, sisters Claire and Dorothea Williamson arrived in Seattle to undergo treatment at an exclusive Pacific Northwest sanitarium. Claire and Dora were the daughters of a wealthy British Army officer, and despite their education and having been well-traveled, they were still naive about people who wanted to get their money through scams. They were orphans in their early 30s, and their other two sisters had died of scarlet fever when they were young so they were traveling the world and visiting what other family members they had left. They took a ship from Liverpool, England to Quebec and then traveled to the West Coast. While staying in the Empress Hotel in Victoria, British Columbia, they saw an ad for a book called Fasting for the Cure of Disease by a Dr. Linda Burfield Hazard. The book appealed to the sisters because they were constantly looking for new ways to become healthier. They weren't suffering from any serious ailments, but they both believed that they had a variety of more minor medical issues. Dor believed she had swollen glands and complained of joint pain, where Claire believed she had a dropped uterus. By today's standards, they would be seen as hypochondriacs. Their interest in solving their medical conditions had brought them to many health centers and institutions that promised miracle cures, but they still didn't feel completely healthy. They had given up meat and wearing corsets in an effort to feel better, but it wasn't enough. Claire wrote a letter to Dr. Hazard telling her that Dora's eyes were bloodshot and seemed to be eliminating a good deal of matter. She also explained that Dora's period was ten days late and that she had a sharp pain over her right temple whenever she moved. Five days later, Dr. Hazard's book arrived at the hotel. In it, the doctor explained how every single ailment in the human body was caused by diet and in turn could be cured with fasting. The book stated, The only disease is in pure blood and its sole cause impaired digestion. The sisters believed that they had finally found the answer to their medical maladies. Claire and Dora had been considering going to a sanitarium owned by Dr. Kellogg of Kellogg cereal fame, but it was all the way in Michigan. Dr. Hazard had a facility in Olala, Washington, just south of British Columbia. In 1898, Linda Hazard was married to her first husband, Erwin Perry. They had two children, Roland and Nina Floyd, in a small town in Minnesota. Linda was not happy with the small town life and left her family to pursue a medical career in Minneapolis, though she claimed later in court documents that Irwin left her and with no support, she sent her children to live with her mother and set out to develop a career. She trained as an osteopathic nurse before discovering the book The Gospel of Health by Dr. Edward Hooker Dewey. Dr. Dewey promoted the therapeutic benefits of fasting and Linda was hooked. She began working under Dr. Dewey, learning everything about the process of fasting to cure illness. Despite Dr. Dewey not being a supporter of internal baths, which is just a fancy name for an enema, Linda believed that the combination of fasting and enemas were the best way to cure diseases. When Dr. Dewey passed away a few years later, Linda opened her own fasting practice. Even though she had no medical degree, she presented herself as Dr. Perry. Her divorce from Edwin was finalized in 1902, and records show she claimed her first victim around the same time. Gertrude Young was in her care, having been promised a cure for the paralysis that she had suffered during a stroke. Dr. Perry had ordered her on a 40-day fast, and on the 21st day, Gertrude awoke in the night, vomiting uncontrollably. 
Her family called her regular doctor, who told her she needed to break the fast, but she refused. Dr. Perry had assured her that the fast would cure her. On the 39th day of the fast, Gertrude died. When the coroner determined the cause of death was starvation, he tried to have the police bring charges against her. Gertrude's family also noticed that all of her jewelry was missing. Since Dr. Perry hadn't broken any laws and the cause of death was under question, she was never charged with a crime. Shortly after that, Linda met and married a man named Samuel Hazard. He was a drunk and a swindler who was dishonorably discharged from the U.S. Army after he misappropriated funds. Not only that, but it turned out that Sam had been married twice before, but only divorced once. This led Sam to being charged with bigamy and sentenced to two years in prison. Once Sam was released from prison in 1905, Mr. and the now Dr. Hazard moved to Washington State to start over. They bought a 40-acre lot in a small town called Olala in Kitsap County. In case you're unfamiliar with the area, it's an hour ferry ride from Seattle, just west of the Puget Sound. Linda started commuting to Seattle to treat patients while she turned her property into a sanitarium she called Wilderness Heights. There's a specific reason that the Hazards chose Washington as their destination. Medical treatments were becoming more regulated and laws were being created that required doctors to hold a medical degree and be licensed in order to practice medicine. Washington State had grandfathered in a law that allowed practitioners of alternative medicine to obtain licenses to practice. With her experience in osteopathy, this gave Linda Hazard an opportunity to be a legitimately licensed doctor. While working on building her facility in Olala, Dr. Hazard opened a practice in Seattle in 1906 and began treating people using fasting, enemas, and day-long hot baths as treatment. Over the next four years, nine people would die under the care of Dr. Hazard. One more notable victim was a woman named Daisy Maud Hagland, a Norwegian immigrant whose parents had at one time owned Algai Point. She died in 1908 and left behind a three-year-old son named Ivor Hagland, who would go on to open one of the most iconic seafood restaurants in the Seattle area. In 1909, a patient named Eugene Stanley Wakelin died from a gunshot wound to the head. Dr. Hazard had been given power of attorney over his estate, and even though he was the son of a British lord, Eugene himself was not rich. It's speculated that the doctor killed him expecting to gain a substantial amount of money, but it was never proven. Despite telling Dr. Hazard that they weren't well enough to travel, in the fall of 1910, the Williamson sisters went to Riverside, California to be in warmer weather through the winter. While there, Claire was receiving treatment for her dropped uterus, but after writing to Dr. Hazard, she received a response telling her to stop the treatment because fasting was the only thing that could cure her. The letter included an invoice for $5 for the advice. When the sisters were ready to travel to Wilderness Heights, Dr. Hazard gave them the bad news that construction had been delayed over the winter. They opted to stay in Seattle and begin their treatment. They arrived in Seattle on February 26, 1911, and met Dr. Hazard in person for the first time the next morning. There, she explained the process to the women. Upon arrival, the patient was put on a vegetable diet of two meals a day. The next week, they would be reduced to one meal a day for a few days, then it would be cut down to a small amount of fruit. Soon, the patient would be given vegetable broth for three days before starting a 45-day fast. During this entire time, the patients would undergo constant, sometimes hours-long enemas. They were also required to constantly walk. Dr. Hazard told the sisters, Your bodies are full of poison. You need to walk it out. No matter how difficult it may be as the fast continues, you must persevere and walk. Walk, walk, walk. Of course, the fast didn't stop there. After 45 days, they were allowed to eat some lima bean broth, and then they fasted some more. On April 22, 1911, Claire and Dora were transported to Wilderness Heights. They both weighed about 70 pounds, and Dr. Hazard hired two ambulances to take them across the Puget Sound to the newly built sanitarium. Neighbors watched as two skeletal forms wrapped in blankets were brought out of the apartment building on stretchers and placed into the ambulances. 
In the time since the sisters had started their fast, Claire had modified her will to include a $25 monthly stipend to the Hazard Institute of Natural Therapeutics. The modification also included instructions that, upon her death, she was to be cremated under the supervision of Linda Hazard. Dora had also given Dr. Hazard power of attorney. After getting the women into the house in Olala, Dr. Hazard split them up. Dora was told that Claire was too weak for visitors, and Claire was told that Dora had gone insane. Seventeen days after being brought to Wilderness Heights, Clara died of starvation. Only that's not what the autopsy report said she died of, but that's because the autopsy was performed by Dr. Hazard herself. Unbeknownst to Dr. Hazard, prior to her death, Claire had secretly sent a telegram to their childhood nanny asking for her to come see them. Margaret Conway was a nurse maid for the Williamson family and despite Claire and Dora now being adults, she was still close to the girls. When their mother died, Margaret had taken over the mother role and they felt just as much to her as her own children by now. Margaret arrived in Seattle on June 1, 1911. She was met by Sam Hazard and told that Claire had died and that Dora was insane. She was then taken to a mortuary where she was shown an embalmed body that she would later say was not Claire. Sam attempted to keep Margaret from seeing Dora, but after repeated demands, she was finally taken to Wilderness Heights. There she saw Dora, who by now weighed little more than 50 pounds. The emaciated woman initially begged to be taken away, but when Margaret returned the next day, she was no longer willing to leave. Margaret stayed in the attic bedroom of the Hazard's home and began taking care of Dora. At first, Dr. Hazard wouldn't allow her to be present during the enemas or to see Dora without clothes, but soon the nurse on site left and Dr. Hazard allowed Margaret to take over her duties. Margaret knew that Dr. Hazard's treatment was actually killing Dora, and when nobody was looking, she would add some rice or some flour to Dora's vegetable broth, anything to give her some extra sustenance. Soon, Margaret was able to move into the small cabin where Dora was living by herself. Over time, Dora regained some of her strength and was awoken from the spell that Dr. Hazard had put on her. After a few weeks, Margaret was approached by another, severely emaciated patient. The woman told Margaret that they were prisoners there and begged her for help. When Margaret informed Dr. Hazard that she wanted all of Claire's belongings so her and Dora could leave, the doctor told her that Dora couldn't leave. Dr. Hazard had had the county declare Dora mentally incompetent and now the doctor had complete guardianship of her. Margaret was able to send a cable message to the girl's uncle in Portland, Oregon and inform him of the situation. John Herbert arrived at Wilderness Heights and told Dr. Hazard that he intended to take Dora. She told him that he could, but he would have to settle her bill. Then she handed him an invoice for $2,000 with a remaining balance of $700. That would be like $20,000 today. They argued through the night and John ended up giving them $500 to settle the bill. As Margaret, John, and Dora boarded the ferry that would take them away from Olala, a local resident pointed and commented how skinny Dora was. Then a local woman could be heard saying, that's one of those girls from Starvation Heights. It turned out that the residents of Olala had given the sanitarium their own name and this one was much more fitting. John and Margaret reported the situation to the British Vice Consul in Tacoma, Washington not only to get justice for Claire and Dora, but to try to save the other prisoners trapped and starving to death under Dr. Hazard's care. The first order of business was to regain control of Dora's guardianship and Claire's estate. In court, Dr. Hazard tried to finagle her way into keeping control of both, but her paperwork didn't add up, and finally, the lawyer she claimed was hired by the Williamson sisters confessed that he never was. The court ordered the guardianship voided and all possessions once belonging to the Williamsons to be returned to Dora. The vice consul pressured the Kitsap County District Attorney to prosecute Linda Hazard. The district attorney initially said they couldn't afford it. The small county across the sound from Seattle did not have the resources. Despite a young woman being murdered in the county, money was the reason she was going to get away with it. In order to get justice for her sister's murder, Dora offered to pay for all of the costs associated with trying Dr. Hazard with the crime. 
In August of 1911, an arrest warrant was issued for Linda Barfield Hazard for the murder of Claire Williamson. During the investigation into Dr. Hazard while preparing for her trial, it was discovered that local authorities knew the so-called doctor well. In May of 1911, authorities were alerted that a man was starving to death under the care of Dr. Hazard. That man was Lewis Emerson Rader, who had served in the Washington House of Representatives until 1899. He had sought treatment from the fasting doctor for a stomach issue and ended up dying after 29 days of fasting. The health department at the time didn't have the authority to do anything about the reports because the doctor was licensed to practice her form of treatment. Dr. Hazard had performed the autopsy on Lewis Rader and she cited his cause of death as stomach prolapsis. It seemed that the good doctor would starve her patients to death, do the autopsy, and then use the condition of the internal organs as the cause of death. But the conditions of the internal organs were caused by starvation. Was she intentionally lying, or did she just know that little about how starvation worked? Nobody would know for sure. It would seem coincidental that all of the patients who died under her care were of a wealthier class, and she tended to create paperwork that would give her access to their money. The Williamson sisters and Lewis were brought to Olala in secret, and Dora and Lewis's bodies were removed under the same secrecy. She didn't want people to know that they had been at starvation heights. It was also discovered that Lewis Rader had once owned some of the property that became Linda Hazard's, and it's possible his death released her from a debt. I think she knew exactly what she was doing to an extent. It would be her final victim who would make it obvious that she believed that fasting was a valid cure-all. The records showed that Dr. Hazard had caused at least 15 deaths while practicing her fasting therapy. Two of those deaths happened after Linda Hazard's trial. Three of the death certificates had been written by outside doctors instead of by Dr. Hazard herself, and they listed starvation as the cause of death. Linda Hazard was arrested on August 5, 1911 at her home in Olala. At the time of her arrest, she had a young blind boy at her facility who had been fasting for three weeks with the goal of restoring his eyesight. Through fasting. Yeah. During the trial, Dr. Hazard claimed that she was being persecuted because she was a woman and other doctors didn't like her natural methods. The prosecutor presented a letter that was sent to Claire Williamson's bank requesting funds in the amount of $1,005 be sent directly to Linda Hazard. That letter was dated April 22nd, but the bank sent the funds directly to Claire, and it seemed that the doctor and her husband weren't aware of this because on May 26th, Sam Hazard stormed into a bank branch in Seattle and demanded to know why they hadn't gotten their money. Well, Claire had died on May 18th, and when the cashier he confronted was questioned, he said that Sam hadn't made any mention of it. It was almost as if Sam wanted the cashier to believe she was still alive. On top of that, on June 4th, Sam used the questionable power of attorney to withdraw $539.10 from Claire's account. Dora's testimony was also quite damning. She described the diet of a thin vegetable broth and occasional fruit juice, the constant enemas, the day-long baths, the excessive exercise, and the violent pounding massages. Linda Hazard used the fact that she was looking healthy as proof that the fasting worked ignoring the fact that stopping her ridiculous and dangerous treatment was the reason Dora looked better. Dora then described the numerous financial transaction slips she signed yet never received any money for. On February 4, 1912, Linda Burfield Hazard was found guilty of manslaughter. The jury first voted for first-degree murder but couldn't reach a unanimous decision. Instead, they agreed on manslaughter. Linda yelled to the press that she was the victim and being persecuted, but for the first time in their relationship, Sam grabbed her arm and told her to shut up. He loved his wife and didn't want her doing any more damage. Linda made a statement during sentencing, saying, I can only say that I have not had a thought of doing anything wrong and that a great injustice has been done to me. It only takes time, of course, to right all these matters. With that, the judge sentenced her to 2 to 20 years in prison. Linda Hazard wasn't sent straight to prison, though. She was released on bond while she awaited an answer to her appeal. During this time, two more women would die under the instruction of Linda Hazard, Mary Bailey and Ida Anderson. 
Linda was tried for those deaths, but since the district attorney believed that she would already be going to prison for her past crimes, he didn't really push the issue. Released once again, it was eventually learned that a wealthy British man was in the midst of the fasting process. Luckily, he was able to make it away from starvation heights with his life. In the last days of 1913, Linda Hazard had lost her appeals and was ordered to the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. On December 19, 1915, almost exactly two years after walking into prison, Linda Hazard walked out a free woman. The following year, Governor Ernest Lister gave her a full pardon in exchange for her agreement to leave the country. She and Sam moved to New Zealand, where she worked as a dietitian and osteopath until 1920. In 1917, she was charged in Auckland under the Medical Practitioners Act for practicing medicine while not registered to do so. She was found guilty and fined a whopping five pounds. In 1920, she moved back to Olala, Washington, where she opened a new sanitarium called the School of Health. Since she no longer had a medical license, she claimed that she was operating a school and she would call her patients students. She continued her starvation treatments for 15 more years, even receiving legal reprimands for practicing without a license. It didn't stop her from starving people, though, and many more people died under her care. In 1925, Leonard Ritter paid to attend the quote-unquote school, where he fasted for 84 days, going from 168 to 100 pounds. He died as a result. The authorities came after Linda Hazard, and she was fined $100. No jail time. In 1935, the sanitarium burned down and was never rebuilt. Three years later, in 1938, Linda Hazard claimed her final victim. She wasn't feeling well, so she began a fasting cure on her own. At the age of 70, it didn't take long for her to succumb to starvation. She died on June 24, 1938. She believed that fasting was the only thing that would cure her illness, but in reality, like the rest of her victims, it was what killed her. This is the final full episode of Season 1. We'll be back in a few weeks with a new season in a new location. While we get that season ready, we'll have a few mini-episodes to publish. Until then, thanks for letting us tell you this sinister story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on and hit like, rate it, or leave us a comment. Join us next season, where we'll take you somewhere sinister.